A lot of energy is required during the first two phases of human digestion, which involves the chewing, tearing, churning, acidifying, and dismantling of food. Eventually, though, there is a payoff. That payoff is absorption, the process by which the energy-rich food molecules are taken from the digestive tract into the bloodstream and then into the cells of the body where they can be used for energy and building materials. Absorption occurs mainly in the small intestine. The secret to effective absorption is simple, surface area. The greater the cell surface area that can come into contact with chyme, the greater the amount of nutrients that can be absorbed. How does the small intestine achieve this? There are four primary ways. First, the small intestine is long, about 20 feet long. Second, rather than being a straight, smooth tube, the small intestine has many folds. Third, the interior lining of the small intestine is made up of thousands of small finger-like projections, called villi. These create lots of nooks and crannies where chyme can come into contact with absorptive cells. Finally, each of the cells along the villi has hundreds of its own tiny thread-like projections, called microvilli. These create micronooks and microcrannies that allow more of the molecules in chyme to directly touch the membranes of absorptive cells. Ultimately, all of these surface area enhancing structural features give the small intestine a huge amount of surface area for absorption. The molecules that can be absorbed in the small intestine include simple sugars, short proteins, individual amino acids, fatty acids, vitamins, and minerals. Tiny nutrient molecules are drawn across the cell membrane into the cells. From here, the nutrient diffuses out of the cell and into the interstitial fluid bathing the cells. Finally, the nutrients are picked up by capillaries and thus move into the bloodstream, where they can be delivered to the organs and tissues that need them. The last phase in the breakdown of food, elimination, takes place as what's left of the chyme, mostly indigestible materials, leaves the small intestine and enters the large intestine, also called the colon. About three to six feet long, the large intestine serves to absorb water, salts, and some vitamins. The last part of the large intestine is called the rectum. Fiber, including gums and cellulose, cannot be digested or absorbed. For this reason, fiber increases fecal mass and speeds the movement of chyme through the colon. With additional mass, more water is attracted, softening the feces and making it easier to eliminate. That's why too much fiber can lead to diarrhea. Fiber also binds to bile, causing some of it to be eliminated, thereby reducing the body's ability to absorb cholesterol from food. Huge colonies of bacteria live in the colon. The bacteria live off the undigested materials that end up in the colon and also release important metabolic byproducts, such as vitamin K and biotin. About half of the feces that we excrete each day is made up of bacteria, and the rest is mostly indigestible materials, such as cellulose from the cell walls of plant matter and other types of fiber. The rectum serves as a storage compartment for the feces before the feces are released from the body by defecation. Why can taking antibiotics lead to vitamin deficiencies? Our intestines generally contain trillions of bacterial cells, including as many as a thousand different species. Bacteria in the digestive tract provide important services. For instance, many bacteria produce biotin, which is a B vitamin, and a few produce vitamin K. These vitamins become available for absorption in the intestines and use in the cells of the body. 
Antibiotics frequently and unintentionally kill a large proportion of the colon bacteria in addition to whatever illness-causing microbe they were prescribed to kill. As a result, prolonged antibiotic treatment can lead to vitamin deficiencies. The disadvantage of using antibiotics is that the normal beneficial bacteria are killed in the process, leaving nutrients and space available for a disease-causing bacterium to gain a foothold. Maintaining a robust population of benign bacteria is your first line of defense against infection by harmful bacteria.